All right, I want to begin by talking about some of what Mark talked about, but seeing if I can simplify it a bit and then build on it. Um, you know, Mark started out by talking about what makes him angry. And um, I think what frustrates me in a similar way is that we actually have the technology and we could do a tremendous amount uh, for people and do, but that it's so difficult in this era of increasingly managed care to do it in that you have to meet criteria and the client has to be bad off enough to be in your program but not so bad off they need to be in the hospital for three days instead and then go home so it's a very hard thing to manage and then if they're um, not doing well that means they're chronic and if they are doing well that means they can go home so it's really quite quite the conundrum isn't it and quite a double bind and my belief is actually that uh, I don't know anyone, frankly, that couldn't use our program, which I'm not trying to get you to send everyone you know to our program, but having started out in uh, sex and marital therapy with couples and then moving to sexual trauma and sexual addiction and then moving to eating disorders and, of course, having to treat every kind of mood disorder and anxiety disorder along the way, and then um, you really develop a sense of the ways in which we all suffer from the same things, and how potent it is to have different variations and different flavors, if you will, of the same suffering in the same room, and to find actually the ways in which people can identify with one another when for their entire lives they felt alone in their suffering. Uh, and so that's part of what I'll be weaving in. So I want to talk first about where Mark kind of left off with uh, attachment, but just briefly. And I, I will reference Dan Brown and uh, David Elliott. Dan Brown Mark and I have had the pleasure to know for about, I don't know, 20, 30, 30 years, time flies. Um, and someone once said of Dan Brown that he has an absolutely encyclopedic um, ability with actually any field he's ever been in. So fortunately for us, he was in the trauma field and then in the attachment field and pretty much all related fields, and now he's teaching meditation more of the time than he's doing any of those things, but uh, has found time on the side to really expand the attachment field and to synthesize all of the prior information into a book that makes, you know, for an excellent reading and also a really powerful doorstop because it is just big and you can work out with it but actually, uh, the content in it is stellar, and Dan has the ability to synthesize pretty much everything that came before and then uh, take it forward. So to make it, unfortunately, too reductionistic, but yet purposeful, I'm going to talk about what Dan and David came up with as the five conditions, really the five components that form the basis for attachment because I think it will inform what I'm going to say in a minute about um, internal family systems. So, um, and when, when they talk in the book about these five components, they talk about what it is in the parent or the attachment figure that actually is able to engender um, the sense of each of these. So the first one is a sense of felt safety. Not just safety, but felt safety, which as we all know is a bit different than conceptual safety. And in terms of what it is that the parent or attachment figure does that provides that safety, 
than the quality that that individual has, what would you imagine it might be? You can feel free to throw things out. Or not. Well, that is really an important quality. That, that wasn't yet the one for safety, but that's a good one. And, that, and actually, even more important, actually each of these was characterized by a consistent amount of, so you're actually really right, yours was the overarching one for each and every one of these was reliable access to or consistency regarding. So actually, you're right, that is prior to the first one. Yeah. Yeah, connection is certainly a piece of it. Um, I'm just going to tell you what he said because maybe it's actually so specific that you wouldn't think to name it even, but just protectiveness. They talk about like, you know, just think about uh, a mother mammal of any kind other than homo sapien, but think about a bear, or think about, and just think about the level of protectiveness, you know, and he's careful to say it's not overprotective, so it's not, you know, keeping the child from exploring their world, um, but it's not underprotective, it's not ignoring threats. So it's just a actually very alive sense of protectiveness. It's the thing that makes a mother able to lift a car, you know, off of an infant so that it doesn't roll. Um, the second one is a felt sense of comfort. And I don't know, I suppose all of us have had clients that actually have had so little that they literally had very little awareness of being able to access what that might actually feel like. And a sense of comfort is really provided by consistent, as you said, access to soothing and encouragement. <coughs> Which is of course different than if you come home from school and need soothing and encouragement and instead you get, what did you do? Oh no, what did you do? And soothing and encouragement is also different than problem solving. What can we do? Let's get this solved. Soothing and encouragement is like a whole different ball game. Um, the third one is to be seen and known. To be seen and known is probably what everyone wants and needs and what everyone ultimately as they get older still wants and needs and is desperately afraid of because of shame. You know, I need you to know me and see me and see all of me and oh my God, I have to recoil because what if you see all of me and know me fully? So I mean, that really is the thing we're grappling with in the therapeutic relationship constantly. And the thing that allows a child to feel seen and known, and probably anyone, is attunement. So not just empathy, but attunement, right? It's what Mark was talking about in terms of that rhythm between the mother and the baby, the invisible rhythm that you can feel. Um, Sometimes clients in expressive therapy say things to me like, are you in my head? And it's like, no, it's all good. I'm not in your head. But it's just you're riding the wave, so you know where it's going to go next. Um, and the fourth one is my personal favorite. And again, what so few of our clients often have experienced, <coughs> which is to feel valued, to feel actually uniquely valued. And the thing that allows a child to feel that is that the parent delights in them. And so many of the clients that we treat uh, were anything but delighted in. So of course, they have no sense that if they're known fully and seen fully that anyone would delight in them, which is a kind of the heartbreaking thing, isn't it? But it's sort of a beautiful thing that can occur in a therapeutic milieu because you have these group members and the way they feel about each other and with the kind of group norms that we're able to sort of create in the environment, they're really able to give one another 
themselves. They're really able to mirror, potentially in ways that there was no mirroring, of really the beauty and the uniqueness and the specialness of the other person. And eventually to accord that to themselves, <coughs> although that takes longer because there is more in the way of it. But um, I find it so remarkable when that is able to be facilitated spontaneously in a group. And I think, how would that happen if it were just one therapist and one client in a way that's as profound as what this group is doing so authentically for this client who never really had access to it previously in any consistent <coughs> way? And then finally, I, I term the fifth thing is unique self. That's more um, my term based on a spirituality text and a philosophical text by Dr. Mark Goffney about unique self. And the way um, Dan talked about it here is sort of the parent's support for exploration um, in an unconditional way unlike my cousins who all had to grow up to be doctors because their father was a doctor and the one that was really destined to be a great architect is now a pediatrician, but okay, I'm sure that's good for <laughs> children in that community. But some part of him is still in there wanting to draw those, you know, schematics and build things in a different way. However, um, so unconditional support for exploration to sort of unfurl, I would say, one's unique self. Dan says one's best self, but I think that could imply something objectifying, so I'm going with unique self on that one. So now, why doesn't this happen more often? So to expand it from what Mark was experienced, more victimization once their feet touch the soil of this country, and then some people were already here and it's like, Sorry, here's like a strand of beads. Do you mind if you trade your land? So, so whether you were here or whether you came and whatever you experienced previously, pretty much everybody came here having experienced some intergenerational victimization of considerable proportion. And when was there gonna be time to work through all that? I mean, my grandparents didn't really have time because A, there was no birth control so, you know, if you were having any sex at all, you were having a lot of kids. And they weren't Catholic, but nonetheless. And, you know, they were working all the time just to create sustenance, just to feed those kids and, um, and making a life in a new country where everything was strange. So there wasn't going to be time to work through anything. And then, you know, my parents had to deal with the fallout from that. Um, and from all that was continuing to adhere from the old country that never got resolved. So, of course. And then, of course, the next generation, things get better, and it's like, oh, they did it all for you. So no pressure there. You know, everyone suffered generation after generation and eked it out so that you could have it better, and, you know, is it so hard to call us? Anyway. <laughs> no, I mean. My parents didn't do that. But anyway, uh, thankfully, thank you. Um, but my point is, you know, no one escapes childhood unscathed. I mean, how could we? And that's not about blaming anyone. That's just a fact of life. So, so problematically, though, whatever the blind spots were that we were required to inherit in order not to threaten what had to remain in place until a later time, you know, was off limits. But we didn't know that, as R.D. Lang says, among others. You know, all this happens before you are aware that it's happening to you. So, you know, you're that perfectly socialized being who doesn't even know what they don't know, who didn't even know what they've been required to forget before they actually had it in their memory to forget it. And, you know, that's our condition. And so if we think it's not our condition, that does worry me a bit, because then we're not allowed to see. So, but no one's allowed to fully see, because it just, we're still evolving as a species. And that's, this is where we are. So, um, so of course there are constraints. And what happens in childhood, as we all have known and experienced, is that certain parts of us are required to kind of go into hiding or to not be developed as fully. 
because you know there's not as much of a call for it in that particular generation, in that family, in that culture, in that school, in that church, mosque, synagogue, in that community. And all of those factors circumscribe what we can allow to unfold in ourselves. So just by definition, even under the best circumstances, with everyone's excellent intentions, if everyone actually even has excellent intentions, which sometimes they do, and things are going to get obscured and parts of ourselves are going to become alienated. And whichever parts those are will vary depending on all of those things that are superimposed, family, community, culture, where human beings are, what got dealt with in the past, what the unfinished business is, et cetera. So I think one thing that's good about that is the acknowledgement of it. So I really believe in working with family of origin issues and looking at it and being able to call things what they are. I was in an expressive group yesterday where I love to be, but it's so much effort because you have to hold the room as, you know, you have to hold the whole room and everyone has stuff that comes up. And, and instead of like thinking about what it might have been like for a seven year old who was living in this family, it's like, oh, that's what it was like when I was seven, sitting at this dinner table on this day in this family with my brother here and my two sisters and my one little sister feeding the dog green beans when no one was looking and everyone waiting to see if my father would explode or whether we'd get through it okay. That was yesterday an expressive group. So it really brings it you know, it's not just talking about the idea of thinking of how an adult would imagine that a child that was seven would feel, it's not so removed, there it is. So, you know, you have to hold that room because you want a person to have, you want actually each person to have one foot in the past so that they can feel what was it like, really, and one foot in the present so that they don't get so merged that they can't actually think about their thinking, metacognition which Mark often talks about in a more eloquent way. But later, Mark and Lee will both get to some of that. So, so yesterday, yes, we were doing that. And let me see where I left off, because I was just like on a flow, just riding that wave into the shore. Um, so people were saying, well, when we were processing, after we process at intervals, but this was at the end. And so some people were saying, well, yes, that used to happen where he would get physical. And I go, get physical? What does get physical mean in this context? Okay, and then what would follow would make the person be in tears in like two minutes and pretty much everybody else in the room. And then a few people later, someone would say, well, and yeah, and then they used to get physical with us. It's like, okay. Um, um, and it's like, I would say, as I often do, okay, get physical. That's pretty euphemistic. What does that actually mean? So I believe that there's tremendous power in just calling things what they are, not labeling them, but actually what is the thing you're talking about? You know, like with bullying, okay, that's a thing. I want to know what happened, what actually happened. Because that's how people stay self-alienated, right? And I think it's a wonderful survival strategy until you're in a safe enough place and you have enough tools to be able to not be flooded by the affect that will be released. So often people, you know, wonder, oh, how can we get to trauma? And I think, it's right below the surface. How can we allow the person to connect with it in ways that are sufficient but not inundating? So then, that is a little bit of where internal family systems begins to come in. Do many of you, sorry. Do any of you know much about internal family systems yet? How many people know just a lot about it? Okay. Uh, I'm probably going to bore you all. Those two or three of you, you're going to be bored. But I'll try to say it in an interesting way so that you're <laughs> less bored. Um, so Dick Schwartz, Mark said, oh, I'm not even going to go there, but I'm just going to say one time 
I was got actually got Dick Schwartz to move to St. Louis for a couple years so that we could learn from him because I thought it was a really important um, thing to learn. But I was like, Dick, can't you go by Richard or something? Because like I would write on the calendar, pick up Dick at airport. And we had these two gay guys that work with us and they're like, hey, what's this? And it's like, oh my God. But okay, sorry. We got that on camera? All right. And then, um, anyway, but Dick Schwartz, pretty much in isolation, started to listen to clients now about 30 years ago. And, you know, they would keep saying things like, well, one part of me feels this way, but then another part of me feels that way. I mean, I'm sure we've all heard that a lot and, and said it about ourselves. And he's like, hmm because I guess he was in isolation and had to entertain himself. So he was like really listening carefully to what clients said. And ultimately, he came to realize that actually every person does have kind of an internal family of self, which makes sense. So this would be um, consonant with people that have talked about self states and about ego states and about, um, you know, when Kernberg talked about borderlines being, uh, when they fall out of the therapeutic alliance, it being because of the oscillation of ego states, really. So, and I think any of us um, who have ever been in a relationship where you're, you're just saying things that you really can't believe, that you know are gonna get you in to a bad space, but you feel so childlike, and the other person's kind of childlike, or you're both kind of adolescent-like, and you're like, could I just get an adult up in here? Because between the two of us, we've got nothing. And, you know, I think we all know there are such things as self-state. I love to tell the story about Mark Schwartz, as he's still in the room, but one year, yeah, he's back there. One year, we went to, uh, just because it entertains me, <laughs> to Mark's family, the fam the rest of the family of origin for Thanksgiving or some holiday, and no, maybe not Thanksgiving, anyway, whatever. It was a food-related holiday, and when it was over, um, and we were flying back, I said to him something like, are you, are you feeling better? And he was like, what are you talking about? I was like, your stomach, are you feeling, are you okay? And he's like, I don't know what you're talking about. And I said, you were in the bathroom a lot. I thought you had some stomach thing going on. And he's like, no. I go, well then why the hell were you in the bathroom a lot? Did you love me with your family? <laughs> and um, he's like, really, was I in there a long time? <laughs> and it's like, you know, he's just kind of hiding out, losing some time in the bathroom, because some part of him, I think, just unconsciously took refuge in whatever he could read, you know, that was in there. Um, because it evokes the same situation or the same constellation of features evoke often the same reactions. And we don't realize, oh, that was kind of automatic, wasn't it? Until someone asks us, where were you? So um, that's really the way it works with internal family systems is one of the things that Dick Schwartz talks about is how it's a lot like actually what Harville Hendricks and Helen, um, um, what's Helen's last name? Hunt. Hunt, thank you. The Hunt family in Texas. I'm from Texas. How could I forget that? And people think, oh, I'm sure as hell not going to do what was done to me. And they really try like crazy not to. But to whatever degree there are parts of oneself that one cannot fully embrace, a little of that's going to get through in our other key relationships. Don't feel badly about it. It's just inevitable. It's inevitable. But it's why, um, it's why it's such a courageous act to go to therapy and to acknowledge that there's still things to work on, because of course there are. So, in any event, what? Let's give a basic outline of internal family systems. Internal family systems, the premise is that we all have a self like capital S. And some people think of that as core self, you know, original self, um, 
essential self, but Dick Schwartz calls it self, capital S. And it really is like sort of your essence. It was there from the beginning. It's not moved by, you know, the waves and currents, the tides so much. It's, it's able to hold steady, not in a rigid way. It's just, it's like soul. It's soul, basically. And it has certain qualities, and you don't have to add anything. You don't have to, like, add water and stir. It's just, it's there, but it gets covered over. That's why some people are like, I don't have that. And sometimes you look at other people and you go, mm, they don't have that. I mean, political figures even, you're like, what the hell? Where is theirs? And not, not everyone, of course, but just, yeah. Um, yeah, maybe one in particular. So in any event, self is present in everyone, though. And it has certain qualities so that you can know it when it pops up because there's nothing you have to do to create it. I mean, Mark talks about seeding the self, and Dick Schwartz would say, you don't have to really seed it. You just have to get everything off of it that's on top of it so that it can, it's like, it's like in Masters and Johnson's days, we used to talk about um, erection, or we used to say engorgement, as a natural function. It's something that happens. You don't have to create it. Dr. Masters would make this point, I like to go off on tangents, by lecturing to a group of people on, you know, erectile dysfunction, and he would say, I, he had these blue piercing eyes, he would say, I will give any man in this audience a million dollars who can get an erection in the next minute. Ready? Go. <laughs> and it, by that, <laughs> he would indicate the reality that it's a natural function, and when you put pressure on a natural function, it doesn't create it, it makes it impossible to take in the natural things that would cause it to just happen of its own accord. So the more you try to control a natural function, the more problematic it is. So Dick Schwartz would say that the presence of self is just, it's innate, it's natural. You don't add it. Although some people do have what's called like a pseudo-self, which apparently pseudo-self parts don't like to be called that. They want to be called self-like parts. Ooh, good either way. Mine don't care. So, but it can look kind of self-like. So self has certain qualities, and Dick's middle name starts with a C. I guess that's it. So he's, and he's really fond of alliteration, so he caused all these to start with a C that he uses to conceptualize self. So, okay. Um, and self is calm, not, not trying to be calm, it just is calm. When self is present, there's just nothing that would ruffle it. And it feels compassion, it's not judgmental. And it doesn't have to try to not be judgmental, it doesn't have to tell itself, oh, now don't be judgmental. And self has access to tremendous creativity. Um, and it has confidence, not like a false confidence, not like a bravado, but it's just confident. <laughs> and it has connection. So self is connected internally and externally, kind of at all levels. It's, self kind of feels its place in the universe, in the family of things. It feels itself. Uh, so self is not so alienated. And, and when parts get in touch with self, they feel not so alienated. Um, and self has, if it doesn't have compassion, it at least has curiosity, like, huh, what's up with that? That's interesting. But not, again, not in a judgmental way, not like, what the hell is up with that? But like, what is up with that? That's really, that's interesting. And self has tremendous clarity. That's my favorite C, clarity and courage because it has, you know, it's, it knows what it knows. Um, so you don't have to create self or, um, again, add anything. You just have to subtract. So what often happens is that um, two things. One, polarization. Two, merging. 
but I'll come back to that in a minute because I have to introduce a couple of other concepts. So there's self, capital S, self. And that's kind of like the nucleus. And in the parts, there's self too. I mean, the parts have self qualities. But the parts of a person um, unfold, and they unfold in a more diverse way. And they have like their own personalities and they hold particular, sometimes particular orientations to life that's not integrated with other parts that hold possibly even polar opposite orientations to life. So, let's give an example. Um, you could have, um, well, act, let's just say, there's three categories of parts. One are exiles. Those are the ones you had to get rid of in order to be loved without even knowing you were doing it. Or those are the ones that weren't really valued in your original attachment environment in whatever way. They just didn't have a lot of survival value in that environment. And so you got rid of them sometimes again before you knew they were even there. So exiles, exiles are the parts of yourself that you kind of send down to the basement of your psyche and then you lock that door and you know, set it on a timer for never. Um, but there's the hope actually somewhere in there that one day someone will come along who will accept you and love you and that that will be enough to release all your exiles and they'll be embraced and they'll be loved and and the problem with that is, um, is almost infinite. But again, we'll come back to that in a minute too. So, exiles. And then the managers and the firefighters are the two types of protective parts, quote, protective, unquote, that sort of keep the exiles exiled because they're like, oh yeah, no good's gonna come of that. So if you were a kid, for example, and somebody said, oh, you cry and I'll give you something to cry about. I'm sorry, one of the stupidest statements ever made. Really? No thanks, I already have something. Uh, none for me. I, sorry, if you ever said that to anyone, just you can stop now. It's, you don't need to. But um, that will get your part that cries sometimes to cry more, but sometimes you'll make it go away. And some part who's a manager will come into being that's like, fine, don't worry about that. You'll never have the satisfaction of seeing me cry. Right, that's a manager. It's preemptive, managers are preemptive. They're like, fine. And they, they adapt to circumstances to keep the exiles back because they think no good will come of it. It can't be afforded. And so unfortunately, the survival strategy outlives the era that gave birth to it, as it's said in the burden slide that Mark already showed, which you have a second time in your handouts that I give you. So, burdens. And the other kind of protective part is called a firefighter. And Dick Schwartz named them firefighters because it's like they come out with those huge hoses and they like hose down all emotion that's beginning to float up from the basement of your psyche, and, um, and they're like, oh no, we've got to get that to stop, hurry, get out those big fire hoses, push them back, and lock that door again. So things will mess that up, but anyway, firefighters are, while managers are preemptive, firefighters are reactive. Preemptive managers, reactive firefighters, and often, There'll be a manager and a firefighter, like a little attached to an exile, sometimes more layers than that, but it's typical. It's almost like they're the parents of the exile, you know, and the manager's like the calm one, like, let's just work all the time and we'll be fine. That'll keep us from having to go home and really interface in ways we have no idea how to be there for other people and put the paycheck on the table, we'll be okay. And then, you know, and then suddenly things happen and that, that doesn't work anymore. Like, you know, you're a man and you're like, I'm putting the paycheck on the table, I got a job, it's good, I, I take them bowling periodically. And then, you know, your wife's like, 
I want more. And you're like, oh my God, what? I want you to feel emotion. I want us to connect. I want you to know who I am and I want to know who you are. It's like, oh my God, no. And, um, you know, that's like calls for a firefighter. So then that's, you know, you could have an affair or something that would definitely handle that situation. And it's very interesting what happens with these parts can just be crazy stuff, especially with the firefighters. It's like another thing that will screw up good managers is good therapy. Because those managers, they had those exiles in check and now there's some therapist and the client starts to trust them and it's like, oh my God, the little exiles want to come out and feel loved and accepted and be in this unconditional po positive regard and it's like, oh hell no. This person is going to go away anyway. Everyone does. We cannot let that happen. And so the person starts just when they get, just when you think, God, this therapeutic alliance is really solid, the person acts out in some crazy way to get you to pop out of the therapeutic relationship. Why? Usually firefighters. They're like, this cannot go on. This is dangerous. So often managers are, you know, because of the schemas that go with um, attachment issues, they're, they're mediating a level of intimacy that's tolerable. And when that gets screwed up, as anything that's forward moving, not just awful things, will screw it up, that disturbs the equilibrium. But that's life. So this is where internal family systems work can come in and be incredibly useful and incredibly, as Mark said, you know, able to go right to the point of what's happening and work with those specific parts. Let's get questions first and then I'll go back to some of these things I swore I would go back to. Anything about that so far? Let's say a woman comes in and she says, I just, I don't know whether I should divorce my husband or not. You know, here are the things on the pro side of what's good about it, here are things on the con side of what's bad about it. You know, my last cognitive therapist told me I should make this list but I still feel like, yeah, I don't know. And, you know, and often we'll join and try to engage and try to help there be a logical decision. Well, in internal family systems, you wouldn't do that. Anybody have any idea what you might do? Yeah, so, right, so you might, deduce from, I have a part, you know, part of me feels this way, part of me feels that way. You're like, aha, there are two parts, they're polarized. I need to go to each of them. So you might do that, you might hear from each of them. And you're like, all right, well, yeah. And so, and first to do that, you'd have to get self. So self, you, so first you have those polarized parts pull their energy out a little bit, which Oh my God, they can do. They can pull their energy out of the person, right? Which has implications for panic attacks. But often they won't because it's the only way they've been heard all these years is to like insist. So often parts are like, I'm not pulling my energy out because then you're gonna send me back to the basement. I'll never be heard from again. No, I'm staying until you listen to me. It's like a kid, no, no. So, but when there's some trust and parts go, okay, you're not just trying to get rid of me so you can shut the door in my face. You're going to listen to me. Yes. And when it's too polarized, parts are like afraid you're going to listen and do what the other one says. So as long as they know, no, we're going to listen to you and then we'll listen to you. Whichever one can go first, the other will go second. Okay. So now they step back. And then when they step back, what you want to see is self. And that is what will happen if all the other parts step back. But now there could be additional parts that will come out. But you just, you keep having them step back if they will. If they won't, you see what they're afraid will happen if they do. And it'll be something like, I think you'll never hear from me. I think you'll do what she says you should do. I think you'll, no, we won't do anything. We're just going to listen and song. So you deal with the fears of the parts really straight on. And if the person's in self, they can actually deal with it. What do you say? What do you say to the part about that? And self will say, 
no, I'm willing to listen to any part of me that has something to express. One at a time, we'll give you the microphone. So what's really good is that you don't have to be a brilliant therapist forever because their self will begin to do more and more of the work. I have some clients, I mean, my God, they're more in self than I am at this point. And, you know, all I have to say is, well, what do you say about that? And they'll give an answer so brilliant that I'm like, thank God I didn't do that because there was no need. So it's interesting because at the same time that the therapy's unfolding, you're, you're actually decreasing the client's level of dependency ultimately on you because it's really their own self that's the one that's going to, as Mark said earlier, reparent them because there couldn't be a better parent than self. And in fact, what we were talking about earlier is if the self of the parents had been able to be more present, then there wouldn't be these particular polarizations and blocks. But in the places where that wasn't possible, there are polarizations and blocks and protection. So again, nobody's fault, but it's like, it's not that the parents were bad parents, it's that the parents were often so covered over with their own firefighters, with their own managers, or with their own exiles whose dependency needs never got met, that the parents couldn't really parent for himself because their self was like under, was like the football under the two teams that fall on top of it. And that's, that's how that goes. And people actually begin to see that and they're like, oh my God, you know, my parent was just so driven by this. And that's like, exactly. And they begin to have compassion, not just for themselves, but ultimately um, others too. So you, as Mark said, you don't want to jump to forgiveness because that's a manager that's like, I just want to forgive them now. And it's like, yeah, no, you're a manager. And you just don't want to feel the feelings of that exile that was so hurt and upset and angry. And no, we're going to listen to all those parts first before anything else. So, as you said, you listen to the two polarized parts. But then what do you think you do about should the person leave her husband or not? Yeah, this, that's right, get the self involved. The self would be involved because the self, you would have moved the energy out so it's the self and you, the therapist, yourself hopefully, that's listening to those two parts. And, and you're really just reflecting, you're not trying to influence them. You're like, so you really, so you might be saying, and the person self might be saying, so you never wanted to be dependent on a man to begin with because you saw this go down in your family and so you're ready to run. Let's say she obsesses about everything that could happen this manager. She tries to see it ahead of time. She kind of restricts experience so that the exile doesn't get overloaded and make bad decisions. She tries to, you know, work and do the right thing and be kind of perfectionistic. And um, that's how she's going to keep the exile safe. And let's say on the other side of it, you're like, oh my God, if I do that all the time, I'll just seem so uptight. I won't have any friends. I'll be all rigid. So you're like, no, I'm going to break some rules. And this one's like, no, you're not. And you're like, oh yeah, I am. And so they're both trying to protect an exile. Let's say this is the exile that's being protected. Is that okay? Can be just, I'm, you don't have to do anything except just sit. And like this exile is like, the, these are like, you know, manager, firefighter. So, um, and they're just like battling, like as Mark said, internal civil war about who has the best parenting. No, this is our strategy. This is what we're doing. And so like the person will function really well, like they're the best person. You totally want to hire them when you meet this part. You're like, yeah, you are organized. It's the person who comes in for a job interview and they go, well, you know, is there anything kind of negative about how I am as an employee? Well, I'm a little bit perfectionistic and you know, maybe too conscientious. Okay, I think that'll work out okay. And this one's like, oh my God, that's just ridiculous. We are gonna go out and have some fun. So, you know, so it's like maybe 
during the work week, this one prevails, on the weekends, this one prevails, and you realize, oh, something's discontinuous here. So in any event, once we go to this exile and the self of the person, let's say, Sam, you're the self of the person. What time is it? Am I done? Okay, Sam is the self of the person with a watch. And <laughs> Sam and I, myself, you know, it's like a tuning fork. If I'm in self, it will help herself come forward too. And so between the two of us, we've like listened to both of these and we're like, wow, your intention is to protect her. And wow, your intention is to protect her. You just do it in opposite ways. And they're like, well, I guess that's right. So they don't really hate each other quite as much, but they're like, I can't step back unless you step back. because so I'm not gonna let us get all rigid. And you're like, I'm not gonna let us get way out there. And so we go to this part and Sam develops this empathic understanding of her because there's nothing to develop. Self just gets it. So it ha Sam has these qualities and the exile that you are can finally feel witnessed and can feel those qualities of attachment that may not have been so available originally. And these two are like, hmm, okay. And then this part unburdens. I mean, it could take one session, it could take 10, it could take whatever. Usually it doesn't take all that long. And then this part is like, wow, she's like a kid again. She's like, whoa, I feel free, I feel lighter. And she invites in qualities she hasn't had like, whoa, self-expression, creativity. Often they're kind of just vibrant qualities, whereas she was like, and these two are like, oh. I go, Sam's, I, let's look at her now, and they're like, yeah, she seems much better. Does that mean you don't need us? And it's like, no, job retraining. You all are actually freed up from this thankless thing that you were in before, but you're talented. And you could do whatever you might prefer to do now that's a little more enjoyable for you than having to argue over how to protect her, because as you can see, she's much better. She's okay. And if she's not okay, like if something happens, self can help her out because now you have access to self, and self has access to this part. So you're like, well, damn, I'm pretty fun-loving. I think I want to find creative and interesting ways to explore the world that are not necessarily, you know, risky, but I might try some skydiving. Okay, and this one's like, oh, you mean I don't have to do everything so intensely? But I am really good at that, so maybe I'll take some business courses and learn how to do a business plan that's even cooler, but creative, too. And so both of these parts can actually, and then self like helps them with their burdens so that they can actually go into a new role. And that is how mental health occurs increasingly with internal family systems. Good, so it might be interesting to play a little piece of a video of Dick Schwartz doing some IFS. You're certainly not gonna you know, learn it from a few minutes, but you can just get a feel for kind of how it unfolds and that'll make you interested and then you want to take Dick's course and then tell him I sent you. I don't get a rebate though, but hell, you know. All right. So that just gives you like a little preview and what that showed you is actually kind of how you do the work because there are like four Fs of IFS basically, because again, alliterations to respond to it. So you focus on the part, you see where you feel it in the body, so you find it in the body. He found like this shroud around his heart. You never know where or what. And you see, this is the barometer of how much self energy you have. How do you feel toward it? So then it's like, he's like, well, I appreciate it, that it's done these protective things, but I'd also like it to go away. So can the part that wants it to go away just step back for now? Yeah. And then, you know, a critical part comes in. And Dick's like, oh, is that, is that a critical part that's saying you're 57 years old, you should be able to feel rage without being scared? You know, that's a critical part. So that one steps back. Then how do you feel toward it? Then he feels appreciative, you know? He feels compassion, I guess, toward it for what its intention to be of help. So that's befriending it. 
and then that sets the stage. That's how you know you have enough self-energy then to proceed and do the work with this part. And you do the work with the protective part and then go to the exile. And then in this video, he unburdens the exile and it's really powerful. And this video, I think, is available on their website, selfleadership.org. And I get no kickback for it, but it's some great work. And that gives you kind of an introduction, anyway, to internal family systems. Okay. Thank you.